everyone and welcome back to Tea Time Thoughts. I'm Kaylin as always and today I'm very excited to talk to you while I drink some passion fruit and peach tea because today, yay for me, I'm talking about another wife of Henry VIII. So I decided when I wanted to go back to Henry VIII's wives that I wanted a little bit of audience participation. So I put up a poll slash questionnaire on my Instagram and I asked for people to pick a random number between one and six, excluding two because I've already done an episode on Anne Boleyn. And the numbers were overwhelmingly for four. I think we had about 40 or 50 responses and at least 30 were number four. So yeah, that was the one we were definitely going with. That also definitely confirmed my suspicion that people are more inclined to just tap the second option on a quiz. Anyway, so today that means we get to talk about Anne of Cleves, and I'm very excited for this because Anne was an icon. Actually, all of Henry's wives are pretty iconic, some a little bit more than others, but that's some tea we're not going to spill right now. That was me trying to be smooth and shady, but whatever. Anne of Cleves is famous for being Henry VIII's fourth wife, and we're going to dive into the whole story behind Anne, her infamous portrait, and the way that her marriage to Henry ultimately ended. So if you don't know much about Anne of Cleves, you've likely heard the story of Anne and Henry's rather terrible meeting. And if you haven't heard the story, but you have perhaps dabbled in the world of online dating, then you've probably lived out this story at least once or twice. I know I have, because lots of guys lie about their height, and then you end up being way taller than them, and they start acting weird about it. Anyway, this is not about me. So, the short version of the story, just so you know where everything's going. Henry VIII, a single king in possession of a large fortune, as well as a very large waistline, about 52 inches around, was in want of a wife. So his buddy Hans Holbein painted a portrait of a beautiful woman named Anne of Cleves. Henry was in love already and had her sent over only to have his dreams dashed when Anne showed up and <gasps> she was ugly. And shortly after having to go through the whole marriage, he divorced her and moved on instead to the gorgeous and young Catherine Howard. The gorgeous and far too young for Henry, Catherine Howard. But again, we'll get into that in a different episode. But of course, there's much more to this story than this quick little summary that has been passed down throughout history. We already know that Henry might not be the most reliable source. Otherwise, Anne Boleyn was just strutting around through court with six fingers on one hand and gnarly moles on her neck trying to seduce every man at the English court. So let's take a step back and start this story again, this time with a little bit more accuracy. So we're going to step back to October 12th, 1537. Henry VIII had got the thing he had always wanted, and that was a son and male heir. And Henry had this child with his third wife, Jane Seymour. However, the birth was a difficult one, and Jane would end up dying less than two weeks after her son's birth. And Henry was devastated by this. He wore black for three months in mourning, and during that time he put on lots of weight, becoming closer and closer to the obese, massive figure that we recognize when we think of Henry VIII today. It was also during this time that he developed gout and diabetes and had terrible sores on his legs that caused him constant pain. So if he wasn't already short-tempered before, he certainly was now. So even though Henry was in mourning for a very long time, his advisors were already working on marriage negotiations as quickly as they could. And the main person on this team was Thomas Cromwell. And if you remember my Anne Boleyn episode, Cromwell is basically Henry's right-hand man, and he played a large role in Anne Boleyn's downfall. So when it comes to picking a bride for Henry VIII, your options are already narrow because he has to marry someone of status, someone whose connections may benefit the kingdom, someone who is possibly going to be able to help push away war with the Catholic powers of Europe, and Henry would ultimately end up narrowing his searches even further because he was also infamous for, uh, you know, just murdering his second wife. And one very funny account comes from Christina of Denmark, the then widowed Duchess of Milan. And she had been told, or rather suggested, marriage to Henry. And she responded to the idea with a very famous phrase now saying, If I had two heads, I would happily put one at the disposal of the King of England. So needless to say, Henry wasn't the Prince Charming that people had in mind. However, there was one name that Cromwell kept pushing in particular, and that was Anne of Cleves. Now Cromwell suggested Anne because he thought that her brother, the Duke of Cleves, 
would be a good ally against the Roman Catholic Church in case an attack was ever sent out against England. The Reformation is still pretty fresh at this point, so basically the possibility of a war wasn't out of the question, and they wanted to take precautions against that. And the family was partially Catholic and partially Lutheran, but Anne's father had also had a feud with the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V. So their enemies were Henry's enemies, and it was a match basically made in heaven. Anne had actually been pulled in and out of the marriage market by her family since she was just 11. She was engaged to the Duke of Lorraine at this age, but their betrothal was ultimately broken up in 1535 so next in line was Henry. And with some reluctance, Henry considered Anne and dispatched his artist, Hans Holbein the Younger, to go and paint a portrait of Anne. Now, one thing that's overlooked is that Holbein didn't just paint a portrait of Anne, he also painted a portrait of her sister, Amalia of Cleves, who must have been very relieved that Henry picked her sister instead of her. So Hans Holbein was instructed by Henry not to flatter the girls in the paintings, but to paint a realistic portrait. And Henry would ultimately go along to describe Anne as nothing fair and has very evil smells about her. He complained that she was ugly and there was a looseness to her breasts and stomach, that she was fat and rude and there was no way he could ever be attracted to her. So that means Hans Holbein must have lied, right? Because Anne was so ugly that Henry VIII ended up killing people over it. Actually, this is where the sources get interesting, because people are divided on this. Cromwell kept promising Henry that Anne was simply stunning, just an otherworldly beauty. He stated that every man praiseth the beauty of the same lady as well for the face as for the whole body. She's excellent as far as the Duchess of Milan, as the golden sun excelleth the silver moon. And Hans Holbein's portrait shows her as a very beautiful woman. I think she's very beautiful. And she has these lovely, heavy-lidded golden eyes, these very graceful hands and gentle features. I think she looks lovely. So some people compare this image to Cromwell's descriptions and think, no, it doesn't match up, but I certainly think it could. Other sources do back this up. They say that she had a lovely face. The French ambassador Charles de Marillac described her as of middling beauty and a very assured and resolute countenance. And another writer, Edward Hall, stated that she had hair that was fair, yellow, and long. And she was apparelled after the English fashion with a French hood, which so set forth her beauty and good visage that every creature rejoiced to behold her. So overall, there are good reports, and the thing is, Henry himself described Anne as well and seemly. So even if Henry thinks she's pretty in at least some sort of way, why do we know her as the ugly wife? Well, let me tell you about when Henry and Anne first met. Anne made the journey in the winter of 1539 to the coast of England, and on December the 31st, the new couple finally met face to face. Their eyes locked from across the room and sparks seemed to fly. The eager couple felt butterflies in their stomachs and slowly closed the distance between them and officially introduced themselves as they welcomed in the new year of 1540 with a tender kiss. I'm just kidding, it was an absolute dumpster fire. So poor Anne has been brought to a country where she doesn't speak the language. She's only spoken German at this point, so that's already gonna make you uncomfortable if you're in a place where you don't speak the language. But the discomfort's only gonna get worse because Anne is waiting at Rochester Castle and she's eventually going to meet King Henry when she goes to Greenwich. But Henry's feeling a little eager for his bride to arrive, so he decides to take a couple of his buddies and go to Rochester Castle and this is the part that is just the kicker for me. Henry disguises himself as Robin Hood and he storms the castle with his squad and rushes up to Anne and kisses her. And the thought process behind this was definitely the old chivalry tradition. The thought was that Anne would be able to see past the disguise and recognize Henry as her true love, but oh boy, no, it did not go like that. And I'll get into that after this. Hey everyone, Kaylin here from Tea Time Thoughts. So I recently joined the Podbean affiliate program, and if you don't know, Podbean is the hosting platform that I use to publish this podcast, and ever since I started this podcast, I've had a few people ask me how to get started making a podcast of their own, so I thought I'd give you guys the scoop. 
So Podbean offers not only a streaming service for podcasts, but they let you create and host your own podcast as well as make a website and distribute your podcast to other platforms super easily. They also give you different insights on your podcast, such as viewing stats, time of day your podcast is most listened to, and more. They offer five free hours for podcasters so you can get a feel for the platform, and then you can decide from there if you want to continue or not. The cheapest plan that they offer starts at $9 a month, and with that, you can access a marketplace for ads so you can work at getting your podcast episodes monetized, as well as more control over your domain and additional insights and statistics that are super helpful if you're ever working with brand deals. So if you're interested, go to podbean.com slash tea time thoughts and get your podcast on the air today. Again, that's podbean.com slash tea time thoughts. I hope to see you there. And now back to the story. So Anne didn't know that this was Henry and she was like, um, who's this dude and why is he here? Why has he broken into my room? And Henry's like, oh man, that didn't work. So he goes back to his chamber, changes his costume and returns as, as himself. So they can go dine together. But once the couple eventually arrive at Greenwich, Henry goes to Cromwell and says that Anne was nothing as well as she was spoken of and then famously says, I like her not. So he tries to meet with some of his advisors and the ambassadors for the Cleves family and he says, okay, what's your return policy? He's not a fan. He's just not interested. But because all this effort's been made, he can't really send her back without offending the Cleves family and losing a potential ally or perhaps risk the onslaught of war. So, and who knows how many years it'll be until he finds another suitable wife. So Henry's like, fine, I'll do it, but let the record show that I really don't want to. So on the 6th of January, 1540, Anne and Henry get married and on Anne's wedding ring is inscribed the message, God send me well to keep. And just to remind you of how weird this is, Anne is about 25 during this time and Henry's 48. So he's almost twice her age, which is gross. But if you think this is gross, just remember that the next wife is Catherine Howard and she's a teenager in this time. Again, this isn't her episode, but I will give her due justice. Anyway, so then comes the wedding night, which was rather uneventful, probably luckily for Anne. Henry says that he tried to do his marital duties, but that he was just ultimately so repelled by Anne, by her stench and how ugly her body was, he just couldn't bring himself to do it. And he said, I liked her not well before, but now I like her much worse. And from this point, this is where Henry starts to spread more of those rumors about Anne that start to stick more with us. He says, again, she's got these terrible smells, that she's fat, and he can tell by her body that she's definitely not a virgin. And he goes back to the Duke of Lorraine's engagement as an excuse that they've basically given him, like, spoiled goods, which is such a terrible way to refer to a woman. But poor Anne, she just has to put up with this nonsense. She's part of an alliance, and she's married to a man who has famously killed one of his wives. So what else does a girl do? So once the marriage has gone on for a couple of months, people start to wonder, hey, when's Anne gonna have a baby? Because remember, at this point, Henry already has a son, Edward, but the thing is, you want to have another son or two, some spares for the heir, if you will. So, and of course, one of the driving factors behind Henry remarrying was being able to have these kids. So some of the women at the court kind of ask Anne about this, and they're like, Hey, Anne, let's have some girl talk. How are things going with the king? And Anne is supposed to have said, Oh, when he cometh to bed, he kisseth me, and he taketh me by the hand, and biddeth me good night, sweetheart. And in the morning, he kisseth me, and biddeth me farewell, darling. And naturally, people were like, Oh, no. So it's very possible that Anne didn't know about the birds and the bees. So she thought a kiss would have been enough to lead to a pregnancy. And Henry very clearly wasn't actually trying. So this is a good indicator of just how doomed the marriage was, in case you didn't get that vibe from the start. And it's possible that very quickly into their marriage that Henry met Catherine Howard, who became a lady-in-waiting for Anne after her original Flemish ladies-in-waiting were dismissed. And he ended up becoming interested in ending his marriage with Anne to get to Catherine. And of course, some people also suggested that the reason the marriage was childless was that Henry was impotent because he is a very inactive man and he's also probably got, if not one, possibly several um, STDs or infections, something of the sort. But Henry alleged that he had dreams of a certain sort that proved that he was still able to have kids, basically. 
And so six months into the marriage, Henry's finally like, okay, it's time to pull the plug on this. And Anne was either leaving the court on June 24th of her own will, or she was commanded to leave the court. There were varying sources suggesting either or. So after she leaves, Henry begins an investigation into the marriage with his buddies again, and they basically decided that Anne's engagement to the Duke of Lorraine was too binding and that it shouldn't have allowed Henry and Anne to get married, so ultimately the marriage would have to be disbanded. Anne was told this later, much later than when Henry had come to this decision, so she was told this on July 6th, so almost two weeks later, and naturally at first she was like, um, what the frick, dude? She didn't agree with it very readily because not only is she basically being tarnished, but this marriage was put together as part of an alliance and she didn't want that alliance to be broken. But once she was reassured that the alliance would still be in place and that Anne would ultimately be rewarded for her cooperation, she eventually did agree and they split up their marriage and Henry was able to do as he liked. But of course somebody had to be a scapegoat for the doomed marriage of Anne of Cleves and Henry. And conveniently, Cromwell was the one that put this whole thing together. So Henry, in spite of all the loyalty that Cromwell had shown Henry throughout the years, he condemned Cromwell to be executed. And of course there's some rich irony there that Cromwell is being executed in a similar fashion to how Anne Boleyn is being executed. Of course Cromwell wasn't executed by sword, he wasn't quite as lucky as Anne was. But it is interesting to think about how basically a little over four years later Cromwell is going to meet the same fate. But he didn't go easily. He wrote a letter to Henry begging to be spared. And Henry, obviously because he's a king, he can have people just read his documents to him. But Henry didn't just have Cromwell's letter read to him once. He had it read to him three times. So he clearly felt conflicted about whether or not he should kill Cromwell or release him and bring him back because they've had a lot of experience together. But whatever he did feel, he ultimately did have Cromwell executed on July 28th, 1540, which was actually the same day that Henry married Catherine Howard. So busy day for our chap Henry. And you want to know something else that's really interesting? Catherine Howard was actually a cousin of Anne Boleyn and they were the two of Henry's wives to be beheaded. So I guess it runs in the family or something. So all that's going on and Henry has gone off and married Catherine Howard. How did things go for Anne afterwards? Well, I guess it depends on how you look at it. Cause if you're looking at the positives, then oh my goodness, my girl made out like a bandit. For agreeing to the split, Anne received Richmond Palace and Hever Castle, where Anne Boyd used to live actually, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. Along with other properties and a nice allowance for herself, it was about £4,000 per year, which now doesn't sound like much, but that was a massive fortune back in the day. And she was given the title of the Queen's Sister and was given precedence over others at court aside from Henry's children and the women he would go on to marry. And like, what a score! She got real estate, she got status, she got bank, and she didn't have to sleep with the old grumpy man. I aspire to be her. Oh my gosh. Man, you're the best. And interestingly enough, one of Henry's advisors actually suggested after Catherine Howard's execution a bit later that Henry should remarry Anne, which I'm sure both Henry and Anne got a good chuckle out of that before saying no thank you and moving on with their day. Although it's likely that she may not have cared for Henry's last wife, Catherine Parr, and when she heard of the marriage, she said Madame Parr is taking a great burden upon herself, which may have been the understatement of the 16th century. And naturally, when Henry died in 1547, Anne's status at the court gradually began to decrease, and his son Edward cut some of her allowance because it was a big expense and they were trying to save money for the treasury, so she began to withdraw more. And what's interesting is she actually garnered good relationships with Henry's daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, and she actually outlived Henry's son and was able to attend Mary's coronation with Elizabeth. And Anne also wrote to congratulate Mary on her marriage with Philip II of Spain. So we can see that they had some decent relationships. However, Anne's religious beliefs didn't quite align with Mary's because Mary was a staunchly Catholic woman. So Anne mainly withdrew from court likely to live out the rest of her life quietly, which sadly wasn't very long. She died likely from cancer at the age of 41 or 42, and she's now buried in Westminster Abbey near the shrine of Edward the Confessor. And I've been there actually. I had a nice little chat with her when I saw her little tombstone. Basically, it was just me telling her 
how much I loved her and how cool I thought she was. And I'd like to go back one day to catch up with her again, but maybe once lockdown's over. And what else is interesting is that we tend to call Catherine Parr the survivor of Henry VIII's wives because we have, you know, the little rhyme, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. But Anne of Cleves actually outlived Catherine, so a lot of people consider her to be the real survivor. Like, for me personally, I think Anne was the real survivor too. And one thing that is also likely is that Anne may have been an influence on Elizabeth as she grew up and eventually became Queen Elizabeth I because Elizabeth noticed how Anne acted very pragmatically and carefully dodged her way through a very dangerous court. She wasn't like Mary in the sense that she held so rigorous, rigorously onto her principles to the point where the people kind of started to turn against her. She instead was able to not necessarily bend her will, but she was able to work on the best way to keep herself out of the hot seat. And I think that's something that's really cool to consider. There are a lot of very powerful women that have influenced Elizabeth to become the queen that she was. And if you're interested in reading more about that in particular, I would recommend Tracy Borman's book, Elizabeth's Women. I use that to write my thesis, but anyway, back to Anne. Another way to look at Anne's life is noticing probably how lonely it was. Sure, she had plenty of friends and a big household to look after her, but after being pushed aside by the king, her image was basically kind of tainted, especially with the claim that her old betrothal was still in place. It basically made her unable to marry anyone else if she wanted to, and she goes on to be considered the discarded wife, and what's worse still, she's remembered as the ugly wife, the bad medieval tinder date, the match made in hell, because that's what Henry made everyone believe, and it's not fair to her, and it's not fair to so many women throughout history how their stories are trampled on by the men who are in power. However, one way I do kind of like to look at it, or a take that I particularly like, is portrayed in the 1933 movie The Private Life of Henry VIII, which I watched when I was doing research for this episode, wherein Anne of Cleves actually fell in love with one of Henry's men that was sent over with Holbein when Holbein came to work on her portrait, and Anne decided to sit and kind of make an ugly face for the portrait, and then when she came to England, she decided to behave very terribly in front of Henry in order to put him off, like stumbling around like she was drunk when she first met him, and cheating him out of his money while playing cards, and then pretending not to know where a baby comes from on their wedding night, and constantly making ugly faces, so Henry thinks that she's just ugly. So then when Henry offers a divorce, she accepts immediately and then can go run off into the sunset with her true love. Now, this may not have exactly been Anne's situation, but considering how things ended for a lot of Henry's other wives, it really could have ended up a lot worse. So that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for listening in and for all the support you guys have given the podcast lately. I've really appreciated all the work that you've done. Two of my videos on YouTube have reached over 100 views and that's just so crazy to me. That makes me so excited. So I really wanted to tell you guys thank you for that. And if you liked this episode, please feel free to like, comment, follow, subscribe. I don't know, every platform is a little bit different, so whatever works for you. If you feel like leaving a rating for the podcast, you can go to ratethispodcast.com slash tea time thoughts. Ratings really do help to boost the podcast. So if you do that, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And you can also get more tea time thoughts content by following my Instagram page at tea time thoughts podcast, or you can check out my YouTube channel at the same name. And if you're interested in donating to the show or requesting a title, you can check out my buy me a cup of coffee page, although I've renamed it to buy me a cup of tea. And don't forget to tune in next week when I talk about Beethoven versus Mozart and how their music is different because I'm partnering next week with the Composer Chronicles to do a promo swap with them. I originally was going to do The Great Gatsby, but I thought I would switch it around and then I'll give you The Great Gatsby the week after. So thank you guys so much for listening. This is Tea Time Thoughts. I'll talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.